You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So, as planned, we are going to talk about the Detroit Lions. Uh, before we get there, though, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about Mr. Forrest Gregg, who recently passed away. Uh, if you've been listening for a while, you know I am not a historian, and I also don't spend time pretending to be something I'm not. So, I'm not going to sit here and... Uh, talk about how I feel about him and how I've always thought about him and in my opinion he's this or that I I don't know I don't I you know slightly ashamed to say I didn't know a ton about him other than he was a legendary Green Bay Packer during the Lombardi era but it's been uh it's been really cool to spend the last few hours kind of getting to know him and uh learn about him and to be honest it's kind of inspiring me to maybe spend a little bit more time I've done it in the past where I've done you know the the rewinds and the, the little research projects going back to 2011 or whatever, it would be kind of neat to spend a little more time uh, looking back at history on occasion. But anyways, um, I'm not going to do that as much, but I do want to talk a little bit about Forrest Gregg and um, a little bit of a parallel that I found that I think is maybe maybe slightly overly sentimental, but I think that's okay given the circumstances. Uh, and then if there's time, which I'll say I doubt, but we'll see what happens, there are a few questions and comments sitting out there, and, and also there's a tiny bit of clarification on the Vikings thing, so I don't think I'm going to get all that far. We'll see. So, as always, thank you guys so much for the iTunes reviews. If you wouldn't mind spending a little bit of time today, if you have iTunes, uh, just just 30 seconds out of your day. Uh, some people, I've had two different people now post um, in the Facebook group how to leave a review if you're curious. As you know, the goal is to get to 150. That is prior to my goal of getting to 200. But if you could do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, as I said, we're not really getting to 150 quickly enough at this pace to get to the live stream. So I'm guessing that's not going to happen. But again, we're only like 19 away, which can be done today. So anyways, beyond that, I want to say uh, thank you to the patrons. Thanks a lot to Eric, Ben, and Pin. Pin, hi, Gur. I, I feel like there's probably something staring me in the face with your name, but I don't know what it means. Probably something I should know, but I, you know, I don't, and I'll just be ignorant. That's fine. But uh, hopefully you guys got a little bit out of that uh, sheet, and again, I'll be continuing to update that, and hopefully it'll be a pretty cool resource. It, it already is, but hopefully it'll be a pretty cool resource by the time we get uh, to the draft. Otherwise, any questions, any comments, please feel free to text or call 608-501-0718, 608-501-0718. We'll take a little break, and uh, I want to talk to you once again about um, Mr. Forrest Gregg. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. 
That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So as I was kind of looking over Forrest Gregg and stuff, something I thought would be kind of neat would be to try to find a, a Forrest Gregg, you know, comp in the draft, which maybe that's a little, I don't know, take it however you want to take it. But I, I really admired the way he played, and I thought, you know, to be honest, that'd be a cool guy to have on the team. And as I'm watching the video, it obviously cuts a lot to Lombardi, and Lombardi starts talking about, you know, he shows on the blackboard how he's, you know, creating a seal here and a seal here, however it is he talks. And then he goes on to explain how the power sweep is going to be the play that everything else is kind of built around. And it started to started to really hit me the parallels, as loose as they may be, between Lombardi and Lafleur, at least insofar as that philosophy. The power sweep isn't everything. They're going to be doing a lot of different stuff. But this is the play that has to work, because this is where we start. This is what we build around. This is the thing that we will perfect. We will get it right, and we will build out from here. Forrest Gregg in a large way, a lot of the, a lot of the guys, a lot of the pieces made all this work. But Forrest Gregg was sort of the engine that made it go. He was a massive piece in the power sweep, which was the foundation. In a sense, he was sort of the cornerstone of the foundation. And so, in this lame attempt to do something kind of creative to honor Forrest Gregg, hey, let's find a Forrest Gregg comp. In a way, it almost came down to we need to find a Forrest Gregg comp because. Similar to what Lombardi did when he came to Green Bay, he tried to instill a certain type of play style. And what in his case, it's one play. I, I think in trying to draw a parallel today, it would, it would be the outside zone, which isn't a play so much as it is a scheme. But it, it, it's it's the same kind of philosophy in which he's going to come here and he's going to work on running the football. Not necessarily in the old school sense of that's how we're going to play the game. This is still going to be passing the football a lot. And no, I'm not trying to say LaFleur is going to be Lombardi. Obviously. I'm, I'm not doing any of that. I'm just saying when I heard Lombardi talk about his philosophy and why he's trying so hard to perfect this one thing and why he cared so much about guys like Forrest Gregg and how pivotal they were to that team because of his philosophy, I couldn't help. Maybe it's just because I do this every single day and I'm thinking Packers like a lot of you people are. Thinking Packers 24-7, I couldn't help but draw the parallels between listening to Matt LaFleur talk about the offense. So in that sense, as much as I was just trying to find something fun to do, it actually started to feel kind of important. Similar to what I've said before about when you get a new defensive coordinator, the first thing that he's typically going to want is to find that guy. For Dom Capers, the guy that was going to set the tone, that, that kind of everything pivoted around was that one good pass rusher and they went out and got him Clay Matthews. Now I'm not going to pretend that Matt LaFleur cares as much about, you know, the run game in general or obviously one particular play like the power sweep as much as as Lombardi did. But similar to wanting to get Dom Capers uh Clay Matthews, it might be similarly important that the Packers go out and find that key piece along the offensive line for Matt LaFleur and his offense. Because again, if everything pivots off the run game and the run game doesn't work, the offense doesn't work. And if the offense doesn't work, it's game over. I mean, that's it. Now, clearly we already have David Bakhtiari, and if we want to say that that's sort of the pivotal piece, fine. But I don't know that he is. David Bakhtiari is the best in the game at what he does best, and that happens to be the most important thing in football. And that's just keeping Aaron Rodgers upright. Making sure no, he's a defender in a sense. He's a defender of the defense. He's a defender of the quarterback. His job is to just make sure nobody gets to Aaron Rodgers, and he's the best in football at it. But what about attacking the defense? Who's the guy along the Packers' offensive line, the Forrest Gregg of the offense, that's going to go out and hunt? Who's the guy that's going to launch out of his stance and go flying out into the open, running toward the sideline, looking for somebody to annihilate and just smashing them? so that the running back has some daylight to run. I know in 2019 nobody really cares about that, and I I keep, I don't know, there's, it's weird because I feel like I'm not an old school guy. I'm not a, I I typically don't, I'm a Packers fan, and I grew up watching Brett Favre. I care about offense, I care about throwing the football, but there's something that just feels like we can't get away from the run. So I know a lot of people roll their eyes when I say, can we get a guy that can run, run block a little bit? People tend to roll their eyes a little bit, but it, it feels like it would be important to be able to impose our will, to not just play defense. Even our defense is playing past.
passive defense. Our offense is paying, playing, in a sense, passive defense. Right? Obviously not Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. They're out attacking. But the offensive line, just don't let them hurt Rodgers. Just keep them off of Rodgers. Running backs, well, just, just get the three yards. The defense, bend, don't break. I would like for this year to be a different tone. And I've been kind of laying that groundwork a little bit over the over this period of time where I've been kind of setting that forth. I like Taylor Rapp because he has a certain kind of passion and power to him. I like Smash Amos because he's just kind of a mean guy. I like the fact that Jair is a seemingly a very, very good, nice, decent human being, but on the football p- field, he's just kind of a brute. He's mean. I mean, he's... He's out there taunting people, punching people, whatever it is he has to do. And again, that's not a great thing to do. But that kind of energy, the Mike Daniels sort of energy, I want that. I want the offense, our opponent's offense, to be on the defensive. I want to start attacking. Maybe it leaves us a little more vulnerable, but I think maybe it's time to start attacking. It's time for our offensive line to start getting offensive. Bulldoze some people. You know, we hear all the time about how it's it's not a sexy pick, it's not a flashy pick, it's not a cool pick like DK Metcalf or TJ Hawkinson. Ooh, it's going to be sweet. I don't really know why. You wouldn't want to get an offensive lineman that gets out and just smokes people? A trailblazer that's just annihilating everybody in front of him? That doesn't get you going a little bit? The, just, you know, and I, I'm not saying this is definitively my stance. Again, I'm I'm to the point where I'm fairly comfortable there aren't too many things the Packers can do that would upset me. There are some that would get me more excited than others. There are certain people I like that if they were on the Packers, I'd get more excited because they're kind of my guys. But I'm comfortable in the fact that I trust our GM to make a good decision, and I'll come around to appreciating the pick in one capacity or another. But at the same time, a guy similar to Jonah Williams to come in and play guard and transition to tackle. A guy like Chris Lindstrom, for example, who has that athleticism to get outside and to, to kind of pull and, and be a lead blocker to the outside. It was funny. I was trying to find a comp, and uh, the Jonah Williams comp came from, uh, from Mark Jarvis. I just asked. I just threw it out there. I just kind of threw out a couple things as I was watching Forrest Gregg. This is what Forrest Gregg did. Who kind of comes to mind? His kind of halfway answer was, I don't know, I guess Jonah Williams, probably because he's a guard slash tackle, which Forrest Gregg played in both positions. But it was funny, I was watching, I think it's McGarry, no, not McGarry, I don't know, whoever it is, over at Washington, the right tackle. And I couldn't take my eyes off the left tackle because he is exactly Forrest Gregg, and I am so upset that he's not eligible right now, or he is eligible, he's not in the draft. It's a guy that last year was supposed to be in the draft, he got injured, decided to stay. This year he was supposed to be in the in the draft, he got hurt again, decided to go back to school. It's Trey Adams. I've never really watched him. I never really appreciated him. I never really understood why he was he was always hailed as this real high round guy, whatever. I just I didn't but watching him and the way that he launches out of his stance and starts running. The only he's the only guy maybe I just haven't been paying attention. But if you watch some clips of, of uh Forrest Gregg, a lot of times offensive linemen and everybody that I watch trying to find a Forrest Gregg, they kinda step back and then start running. Right, because you have to clear the offensive line to, to start running, otherwise you're just gonna smack into somebody. The way that he kind of launched and just was already going in that direction at full speed. It just the, the the power and the aggression and the speed at which he was able to do that was just blew me away. And Trey Adams is the kind of guy that does that. And if we don't get a, a tackle, that's gonna be he's gonna be top of my radar day one. The left tackle out of Washington, Mr. Trey Adams, if we don't end up getting a tackle. But I don't know, I, I it it just kind of built in me an appreciation. Uh, looking over Forrest Gregg and what he was able to do. And again, considering that parallel and how important the run game is going to be, to be able to get Matt LaFleur that kind of a piece, the piece that, again, the cornerstone. You've got the foundation, which is the run game, and the cornerstone, which sets everything in motion. Everything is set off of that cornerstone. And if you got that set right, everything else is going to be okay. I don't think we have that piece. We have guys that can make it work. We have an offensive line that can make it work. We have, you know... A coach that knows how to how to coach it. We've got an offensive coordinator. We've got a bunch of other people in place, and just the fact that McCarthy never really taught it that much, and these guys are going to really drill it over and over. I'm sure our guys will get it, but there's a difference between getting it and perfecting it. That's what Lombardi did so well. He understood the importance of getting the foundation right, and he drilled it over and over, not just in practice, but drilled it into the minds of the guys, of the players, so that they believed, if we can get this right, they can't stop us. And he was right. 
It's, it's similar to what we went through with special teams several years back where McCarthy decided he's going to start sitting in on special teams meetings because the guys just didn't really understand the importance of it. And I don't think the Packers and the coaches understood the importance of it. And it wasn't until we were about dead last in the league when they said, listen, we got to do something about this. We need guys to start understanding this is important. Because once you start believing like a lot of the NFL does with the run game, that it just doesn't matter, that it's just some kind of secondary thing that, you know, it's the only purpose of the run game is to get us in the third and short. The only purpose of the run game is to set up the pass game. No, stop saying that. Because if that's what's getting drilled into these guys' heads, they don't care. Our job isn't to execute this run play so we can get three yards so we're closer to a third and short. Our job is to execute this play to perfection so that the other team can't do anything to stop it. To get these these linemen out moving laterally to go out and hunt somebody. To get their eyes locked on someone and just absolutely annihilate them. So that Aaron Jones doesn't have to perform magic tricks to be able to get his 10, years, 10 yards on nothing. He's got nothing but daylight. So anyways, that was a fun little exercise. If you haven't spent a few minutes on YouTube looking up Forrest Gregg, just go watch him. He really was a lot of fun to watch. A lot of times you watch kind of the older guys and it's like, you know, they look slower, they look whatever partially probably because of the cameras, but also, let's face it, they were, right, with advancements in technology and and science and understanding how to build up your body to be, I mean, we got guys that are, you know, 50 pounds heavier running who knows how much faster than guys were back then, but you can still watch him and and appreciate what he was as an athlete, so if nothing else, I've, I've got a renewed sense of excitement for the possibility of getting not just an offensive lineman. I'm not just looking so much from the standpoint of, well, next year we're not going to have a tackle, and this year we don't have two very good guards, and it'd be nice to kind of just improve that. I want a stud, man. If Andre Dillard is that stud, go get that stud. And and, and look, I'm having a hard time getting off this topic because I really am excited about it. I really do believe, and I have believed this for a long time, the foundation of a football team is the trenches. That's offensive line and defensive line. I think Mike Pettin embraces that absolutely, which is why he's so firm in his belief in having a strong defensive line. If you look at when the Packers were most successful, they had great offensive lines. Brett Favre with his great offensive line. Aaron Rodgers when we had Bakhtiari and Sitton and Lindsley and Lang and, and, and Balaga. I mean, look at the Cowboys, how dominant they were when they had the best offensive line. And then I said right out of the gate, if they cannot let that erode, they did. Guys started retiring, guys started leaving, they didn't replace these guys, and the team just never got back to where it was because they allowed the foundation to erode, thinking that they can get by with this flashy running back and this new flashy quarterback who suddenly isn't very good without an offensive line. Fundamentals foundation i mean just just it's the boring stuff that helps you win the legion of boom for all the flash and all this other stuff that was going on what they did really well was play good foundational fundamental football yes richard sherman could glue on a guy about as well as anybody in the nfl but you know what they did they functioned as a unit when 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 you threw a screen pass there wasn't just one guy in the area there was one guy there who was number 1 attacking number 2 was very 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 good at tackling and number 3 you had an entire defense that was swarming and was going to be there within seconds and it didn't matter if there was already two guys three guys or four guys everybody kept running all the way over there good tackling good discipline offensive line defensive line it's 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 uniformly the boring stuff that, that ends up being the mo- Now, it's not the boring stuff that kind of takes... That's just the foundation. You build on that the fact that Aaron Rodgers and his great arm. You build on that the Devontae Adamses. You build on that the Aaron Joneses. But it's when, all, when you have all the flashy stuff and it never seems to come together, it's because your foundation is garbage. That was the problem with the Green Bay Packers. It was the discipline. It was the communication. It was the understanding. It was the study habits. It was... Not having a good enough offensive line, defensive line. The, the 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 tackling was terrible last year. So it's great that we've got this real flashy new offensive scheme kind of guy, but I'm really more concerned about his ability to implement the simple things. And the fact of the matter is, as much as Matt LaFleur is going to bring a new scheme, which is kind of cool because it's modern and new age, I think it's Matt LaFleur's focus on fundamentals that are really going to help this team the most. And again, from that, you build the complexity on top of it. Otherwise, we're just building the White House on sand. So, all right, I'm, I'm off it now. We're off it. Forrest Gregg, eternally grateful for what you did. Fantastic person, just like most of the Lombardi era guys. Great person, great human being, hardworking, tough, gritty. 
absolutely fantastic career, and it's awesome that he um, that he was a Green Bay Packer. So anyways, we'll take a little break here, and uh, then we'll start talking about the Detroit Lions. So real quick before we get to the Lions, um, as I've been doing this more, I've, I've realized that, you know, as the audience gets bigger, you're talking to a broader range of people, and you're more likely to say things that you know, you just have to be more careful what you say. And one of the things that I used to do that I'm trying not to do as much is to be super dogmatic in so far as me talking to a Packers only fan base. In other words, I assume I'm in a room full of Packers fans and I can just say whatever I want and nobody cares. And I've been called out several times by Bears, Vikings, Lions, Redskins, all kinds of fans because a lot of people listen to the show. Well, I got an email from uh, Daniel. And uh, he had a few things to say about the Vikings. And as soon as I saw I'm a Vikings fan, which is th- the very first line in his second sentence here, I immediately started freezing up thinking, oh no, what did I say? Because I, I forget. I can get super dogmatic and trash the Vikings because I forget there's Vikings people in here. But a couple things I wanted to point out. I've said it several times, but please bear in mind, when I overspeak something, sometimes it's simply to counteract a narrative. If I said Kendricks is trash, I misspoke. I think Kendricks is overrated, and I should probably just say overrated, rather than me just going on trashing guys, because the narrative is that they're really good football players. I don't think he's a very good football player, but I don't think he's trash. But anyways, uh, Daniel, I appreciate the email. The only thing I want to dive into really quickly, just to give you a little bit more insight into this, as well as anybody else that's interested, but you you had brought up Pat Elfline and how um, Vikings fans really like him, and according to PFF, he's complete trash. I I just want to kind of highlight what exactly specifically PFF has to say about him. So specifically, as far as grades are concerned, he had the third lowest um, pass blocking grade of anybody. The only two that were lower, Mike Boone, who played one snap, so that doesn't even count, and then Danny Isadora, 145 snaps. So again, relatively low sample size. And as far as run blocking goes, he did have the lowest of anybody, including guys with, you know, one snap to their name, the lowest run blocking grade of anybody, which isn't great for a center. As far as his statistics, they have him down for four sacks, five hits, 24 hurries for a total of 33 uh, total pressures. He also added to that seven penalties, which is the second most of anybody along the offensive line. Looking at those pressures, it was the fourth most. Uh, Mike Remmers, Riley Reef had 42 pressures. Tom Compton had 34. Mike Remmers, however, had about 200 more snaps than Pat Alfline had. And as far as Riley Reef is concerned, even though he had 42 pressures compared to Pat Elfline's 33, only three of those were sacks, whereas Pat Elfline allowed four. And finally, as far as his week-to-week breakdown, and by the way, in 2017, he was graded much higher, but looking week-to-week, they only graded him positively, which is to say 60 or higher, which isn't even necessarily positive. I'm just saying games that are above average one time. Week six against Arizona, which is literally the worst team in the NFL. Looking at his grades, 52, 54, 48, 68 was his one game. 55, 39, 49. Oh, I'm sorry, 62. I missed one. There you go. Perfectly average against the Bears. 56, 49, 56, 37, 56, 38 against Chicago. So I, I, I guess what we can say is that Packers and Vikings fans are both very happy that Pat Elfline is your center. <laughs> Because that's, I mean, I, I don't know, was he hurt or something? Because I, I can see, I've seen t- guys with bad grades, but they're kind of intermittent between, you know, they've had really, really good flashes, and then they have really, really bad game, and it just kind of balances out in the negative. This guy legitimately had one good game all year. It wasn't even that good of a game. It, technically, by my vernacular, isn't even good, 68. It's just high average. And I guess I also misspoke. He was a third-round draft pick. I know at the time they were talking about him possibly going as high as second or whatever, but I think he was coming out of college was a center, which is probably why he fell, but was seen as one of the most talented um, offensive linemen uh, coming out of college football anyways. So we'll see what happens, but I'm, I'm certainly not worried about him, and I am very excited about somebody like Mike Daniels and um, obviously Kenny Clark. And by the way, the last time that they played, he did not play in week two, but we did play in uh, week 12 last year. He allowed zero sacks, but two hits, three hurries for a total of five pressures, which is the second highest amount of pressures of any um, any game that he had last season. The only game where he gave up more pressures was Week 17 against Chicago, where he gave up six. So, anyways, we'll see. I, I you know, I don't watch him every game like you guys do, but it'll be interesting to see what uh, what the Vikings do with that offensive line. But, anyways, let's uh, let's talk about the Detroit Lions now. So, as as I have said. There seems to be somewhat of an inverse relationship between the talent that the team displayed last year and the team's ability to improve. 
The Detroit Lions were the worst team, but they may have arguably, Packers fans obviously think it was the Packers, and I don't disagree with that. I think it probably also is the Packers, but you could make a case that the Detroit Lions got better more than any team in the NFC North. Now, it's unquestionably going to be the Packers when this uh, draft is over with, just by sheer volume of picks. But taking a quick look at some of the things they did, uh, January 1st, they went out and got Connor Cook uh, for the quarterback. March 11th, they added Danny Amendola. Regardless of what you think about him, um, there's familiarity with Danny Amendola and their new head coach. Granted, he was a defensive coordinator. I don't know how much there was in, in place there or in common between the two. But if you have their head coach, Matt Patricia, implementing you know, a Bill Belichick-style team and offense, I suppose, getting Danny Amendola and bringing him here and saying, look, I just want you to do what you did with the Patriots, I should be able to do something. And they needed that slot guy, and now they got that slot guy. One year, $5.75 million. March 14th, there was a bit of a flurry. Justin Coleman, quarter, cornerback, Seattle Seahawks. I think he's a very good football player. We'll get into the specifics of that. Trey Flowers, obviously, was their massive signing. Whether or not it was a good value, I don't know, but another New England Patriot. Obviously, there is direct relationship between him and Patricia. There's no question that he's going to be able to get the most out of Trey Flowers. Five years, $90 million. Jesse James, another good addition. Tight end, again, no idea how good he's going to be in uh, Detroit. He's not an elite player, but he's a, a certainly a better player than who they have. Tight end from the Pittsburgh Steelers, four years, $22.6 million. There's uh, Ode Abushi, I think that's how you say his name, guard from the Arizona Cardinals. Andrew Adams, safety from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. On the 19th, they added Tommy Lee Lewis, wide receiver from the Saints. Uh, the 21st, Logan Thomas, tight end from the Buffalo Bills. And the 23rd, Rashawn Melvin, cornerback, Oakland Raiders. Now, they also lost some people. They lost Glover, Glover Quinn at safety. That's a pretty big um, pretty big loss. I've talked about him several times. Prior, you know, The last time I talked about him, I said it was kind of interesting. He's, he's very up and down. Some years he's just elite. Some years he's garbage. But he's gone. They lost wide receiver Bruce Ellington to the Patriots. They lost linebacker Nick Grigsby. They lost TJ Lang, Lang, obviously, who retired. He was, I think, released first and then retired. They lost their cornerback Nevin Lawson, and they lost Trevor Bates, their linebacker. So as I've mentioned before, when you look at a lot of the NFC North, with the exception of the Packers, they have that sort of, if you want to call it elite, or don't want to call it elite, fine, but I'm going to use the word elite because it's, it's the one guy. Right? It's sort of like what I just mentioned about Clay Matthews, that one guy who's going to be able to torment people off the edge. Theoretically, that's going to be Mr. Trey Flowers. And looking at this defensive line, depending on how you want to quantify you know, what it is you're looking for, this could arguably be one of the best defensive... The, the NFC North actually is extremely talented along the defensive line at this p- particular point in time. I'm happy with where the Packers' front is. With our outside linebackers and our defensive line, I'm very happy with that. The Chicago Bears, I know, are very happy with their front. They had one of the more talented fronts. Regardless of what I had to say about them and the numbers, the fact of the matter is they were very effective in what they did in both the run and the pass. The Vikings, as I said, might need a little bit of help, but they're not too far away from being right back at the top. Again, add Christian Wilkins, I've got nothing to say anymore. Easily could be one of the better defensive lines in in, in the NFL. With that said, though, just looking at this line, this is maybe the only group that has arguably, and it, you know, you got to kind of tweak it a little bit. I, I don't think this is going to be the normal alignment, but as I'm looking at PFF and the Detroit Lions line, the only team that has four elite players on the defensive line. Now, granted, most people don't care about your ability to stop the run, so Snacks Harrison isn't given the amount of respect he deserves, but there isn't anybody that is even in the same universe as him when it comes to stopping the run. There just is not. Trey Flowers, at least last year, whether or not he's going to be able to sustain that, I don't know, but he was given an elite grade. Um, they've got Deshaun Hand, who had a, in his rookie year, I'm calling it elite, it was borderline, 87.4 was his grade. They have him at defensive end, I think he's going to be more of a defensive tackle, but he's he's interchangeable in that way. And then obviously on the inside you have A. Sean Robinson, uh, he was kind of in that bust conversation another early round I think he was a first round guy out of Alabama 2016 not very good 2017 not very good 2018 he was graded 11th 89.8 which is elite Trey Flowers 89.7 Snacks Harrison 92 now again he's not giving you very much as far as pass rush but as a run defender that's where all that comes from this is a scary front man now I think this is actually pretty similar to the Bears not that Trey Flowers is in the same conversation as as Khalil Mack 
But it's similar to the Bears in which they just have some good, solid, foundational guys who mostly are going to make sure that you're not running the ball on them, but they also do have a little bit of pass rush threat, mostly coming from Trey Flowers. Right, Akeem Hicks is, is a talented guy. He's going to get some penetration on occasion, but he's mostly a run defender. Eddie Goldman is a guy I like a lot, but he's mostly a run defender. Kind of the same situation here. And and, and as I said, um, Deshaun Hand is primarily going to be a defensive tackle. He's going to get flexed out to the outside on occasion. But similar to the Bears, you got Trey Flowers and true edge defenders. There's not much else. Romeo Arqua is a guy that they just re-signed. He's not good at all. If he's anything, he's a run defender. He has no pass rush ability whatsoever, which is why, and I I don't think I'm going to get an email from a Lions fan saying I'm full of it, because prior to Trey Flowers coming, I did mock drafts on my YouTube channel, and I would draft a linebacker, and people would lose their minds, or I would draft a corner, and people would freak out because we need an edge defender. So if you got Trey Flowers, that means you have one and nobody else, right? Pretty basic math. You had zero, which is why you're desperate for it in the draft. Now you have one. But again, similar to what I said about the Vikings, if the Detroit Lions draft a guy like Montez Sweat, if they draft a guy like Brian Burns, let's say a guy like Josh Allen does fall, which is entirely possible. I mean, let's just walk through it because it won't be that hard to make it make it work. Although Josh Allen probably isn't a great fit for their scheme, but I'm just whatever. Let's have some fun. Lions are picking at eight. If the Arizona Cardinals do take a quarterback, which I still think is silly, and I would not bet a lot of money that they're going to do it, but if they do it, fine, then Nick Bosa goes number two, probably. The Jets are trying to seemingly trade out of this spot. A a team that supposedly really wants um, Josh Allen, apparently. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems like they're trying to trade out of this spot. If somebody trades up, let's say they take a quarterback, then a quarterback goes at three. At four, I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Oakland could go quarterback, depending on what's there. Oakland could go uh, linebacker. Some people say that uh, Devin White could be an option here. Or obviously, Quinn and Williams is the is another guy right there. But let's say they take Devin White. Pick five. Quinn and Williams. Why? Because he's there. Pick six is the Giants. Giants take a quarterback. Pick seven, Jacksonville. They need offensive line. They go offensive line. Detroit's already up. It's not that hard. Either way, Brian Burns and Montez Sweat are almost positively there. I mean, I'm struggling to find a scenario. I mean, okay, so the Jets take Josh Allen, Oakland takes Montez, and what? Brian Burns is going to go to Tampa? I don't think so. So again, I'm looking at this Detroit team, and I'm not super scared of it as of yet, right? They don't have linebacker talent that's exploitable. They don't have super great corners, although Darius Slay is a good corner. Maybe not quite as good as Lions fans think, but I'm certainly not going to trash him. He's a good corner. Devontae can beat him, but he's good. Honestly, don't know exactly what to think of the safeties. But again, one or two pieces here could make a big difference. Even linebacker, if a guy like Devin White falls, and you think about his athleticism and, and, and take into account this defensive front, not that Devin White can't take on blocks, but you think about a guy that, that has that kind of athleticism and the ability with his range. If you have a good defensive front that's able to keep blockers off of your linebackers, a guy like that is just going to fly. So, you know, pass rusher, then in the second round, get get a uh, a really good corner. There's, there's There's some good corners in the second round. Get a guy like Julian Love out of Notre Dame. You know, maybe DeAndre Baker falls into the second round. I, I, it's kind of iffy on that because his, his skill set, his uh, relative athletic score and all that stuff is really low. But his production was just off the charts, and he just plays really well, right? It's The tape looks good. He's, he's not a spreadsheet guy, which is sort of my new thing. But as, as, as much potential as there is, I also think it's one of the more exploitable teams. Which is to say it's it's really kind of iffy, or at least exploitable defenses. We haven't gotten to the offense yet. But as I'm looking at it, you know, again, depending on the moves they make, but but because this is prior to the draft, we'll get to the post-draft thing in a little bit, a few weeks or whatever. But as this stands right now, I'm not really scared of this defense. Trey Flowers is going to help, but going up against David Bakhtiari, I'm comfortable. It might be difficult to, to run if we're trying to run up the middle, but remember, we're going outside zone now, which means we're moving more laterally. If we're running away from Trey Flowers, 
And again, this is an area where having a really solid interior, whether it's our guards, our tackle, whatever, to be able to make sure that they can handle their assignments for, for our guard to be able to get outside of Snacks Harrison and just make sure he doesn't get penetration because he's not going to chase anybody to the sideline. The biggest thing that we have to worry about with that kind of a, a, a outside zone scheme is going to be the linebackers and the safeties, and they do not have good linebackers. So the run game, despite, again, their, their really solid defensive front, I think it's beatable. You look at their secondary, and again, they have Slay, but I, I trust Devontae to be able to beat Slay. Then you look at the rest of their corners, and I you know, I don't know who's going to end up winning these jobs because they don't have anyone that's super dominant. If Rashawn Melvin is going to be their other outside guy, I mean, I, I, I would assume Geronimo, Scantling, Jamon, EQ, whoever it is that's on the outside, it, not that it's necessarily going to be domination, but they can handle that. They can win that matchup. Same thing with the slot. And I know I mentioned Justin Coleman, and uh, I think it was a good pickup, and it is. It's going to be an improvement, but he's not a, a super dominant guy. He's, he's not an elite player. Everything about this is beatable. The safeties, I think, are beatable. I'm assuming Quandre Diggs is going to be playing safety. Again, I don't really know. I know the Lions like to, to shift things around quite a bit, and there's a lot of guys that left, so I don't exactly know the nuances of where, who's going to play where, other than obviously Slay is going to be Slay. But they're going to have to get creative. And to be completely honest, as I'm looking at this, depending on who's available, because, you know, there could be a really good piece. If they really like Montez Sweat, they're going to take Montez Sweat. If they really like Brian Burns, they're going to take Brian Burns. But I don't know that it's impossible the Detroit Lions want to trade back because, as I've mentioned before, in that top 60 range, kind of where from where the Packers are to the back of the second, there's a lot of really quality talent. If they can pick up another, I don't even know what they could get for it. I think like if Carolina moved up from 16, they could probably get Carolina's pick. So if they went from top 10 back to the middle of the first, they could end up getting two second round picks. Again, there's probably going to be some really quality talent. I don't know that they're going to want to do that. But depending on what they actually think of these guys, they may want to do that. And listen, at, at pick 16, you might be able to get Devin Bush. You might be able to get Byron Murphy. You're probably going to be able to get Greedy Williams if you want to go that route. These are still high quality players. In terms of what the Lions might want to do to be able to kind of slow down the Packers, I really think making the Packers one-dimensional is going to be the biggest thing, and the, the best way to do that is going to be to upgrade your linebackers. As it stands right now, as I said, I think the Packers are going to be able to run on you. I also think that the Packers, if they make an addition at linebacker, and even if they don't, Jimmy Graham, I think a lot of the failures that they had was going to be because of Mike McCarthy and his inability to understand how to utilize them. You have, for example... Mercedes Lewis, his old offensive coordinator from Jacksonville, is now reunited with Mercedes Lewis. He was pretty good with Jacksonville. Jimmy Graham, although he's getting older, is still a talented guy. The, these guys are going to be able to, to pick you apart. And if we end up getting a slot receiver, which I would assume who's going to be working in the middle of the field, and you've got you know Jared Davis over there trying to do something in the middle of the field to try to stop that, I just think it's it's a losing battle. As far as what the Packers can do, you know, obviously we can go wide receiver again. I, I'd like to go offensive line. I think this is going to be a, the, the Lions are going to make this a trenches battle, and I think that's the one battle at this particular po point in time we might lose. Now, again, if we're playing defensive offensive line, which is to say just make sure these guys don't get to Rodgers, we'll be fine, and maybe that'll be the plan anyways. We're going to throw the ball. What are you going to do about it? Well, you can't cover our guys. You can't cover our tight ends. You can't cover Devontae, and now you can't get to our quarterback. So why do we care? I care because they're making us one-dimensional. They're saying, fine, but you're never going to run the ball against us. And I want to look at them and say, no, we're going to do that too. We're going to take whatever we want. So in this instance, yeah, I'm, I'm probably looking at a guard. Not that I would do that at 12 necessarily. You could maybe, again, look at a guy like Jonah Williams who's going to come in at guard, then later transition to tackle, whatever the case may be. But again, they've got a really solid front. And that's true across the NFC North, as I said. Getting solid, getting dominant along the and we know what happens where as far as offensive line when you solidify it they, they are there and and bear in mind if we get this thing fixed this, these are guys that are going to be with Aaron Rodgers for the rest of his career right usually that happens when you get these guys they're with you for about five-ish years Rodgers has about five years you know we're locking up Bakhtiari long time long term even after his contract is up Lindsley already got locked up we need two guards and a tackle let's get to work Let's find this offensive line that's going to be able to lock down Aaron Rodgers and protect him for the remainder of his five years with the Green Bay Packers. That's sort of my thought process. Flipping it the other way, um, I'm similarly unsure about the Detroit Lions. Obviously, as always, there's some concern about their ability to throw the ball. Kenny Galladay has, a, has become a pretty good wide receiver. 
Marvin Jones is another good guy that you have to account for. I mean, he's not he's not in the elite category, but he's the kind of guy that if you've got only one corner, and this is why I want the Packers to make sure they have a number two, because if you've only got the one corner and you're able to take away Galladay, let's say, Jones is going to be there as well. And if you don't have a number two that's sufficient, he's going to destroy you. And now again, they have Danny Amendola in the slot, who also is not elite, but he is a good role player. And he's the kind of guy that, you know, again, if you want to lock down this guy or this guy, it's just another versatile piece that they're going to try to exploit. And if you don't have an answer for it, you're in a lot of trouble. Now you add into that the fact that they've got a running back, a viable running back that they can lean on in Carrion Johnson. Carrion Johnson already was very impressive. He did get injured, so he didn't play as much as they would have liked. Um, the biggest problem they're going to have, though, is this offensive line, allowing TJ Lang to leave. Um, although I, I understand it, it, it makes you worse. And um, I think this is a pretty similar line to the Chicago Bears line in which they have guys, and then they have guys that aren't very good. They don't have any dominant players, right? Wagner and Decker are decent. Glasgow in the middle is decent. Frank Ragnow, guy that I really, really liked, another really talented offensive lineman. I think he went, where did he go, in the second round, first round? He went a lot earlier than was expected, and I was excited because I'm looking at it like, see, I knew he was awesome. That was my guy from the start. I never know why he wasn't seen as a higher-rated prospect. Well, he was average last year. As a Packer fan, I hope he never gets better. As somebody who desperately wants to see one of these guys actually pan out, I'd like to see Ragnow take a little bit of a step, but I'll, I'll stick to my Packers fandom and say I hope he gets worse than ever. And then you got Kenny Wiggins over at right guard, and that's no good either. So again, it's a situation where I really like our chances as it stands. I know they have the talent similar to the Vikings with their wide receivers. I think they have a capable enough quarterback to be able to distribute the ball. Jesse James at tight end is going to be a role player, um, you know, versatile piece, decent receiver, decent blocker. But I'm not overly concerned. I think in the trenches battle, the Packers win. They're not as inept as the Vikings, but they're definitely beatable. I think running the football is going to be a little bit difficult because, again, their offensive line took a step back. Our defensive front took a massive step forward. Adrian Amos at safety, I think, is going to help quite a bit. And so making them one-dimensional, I think, is going to be the first step. And then being able to cover them is going to be step number two. And as much as I appreciate Jair, we need contribution from guys like Kevin King. We need guys um, like Josh Jackson to be able to step up. Uh, as far as what would I like to be able to, mm, you know, take away the Lions' chances even more of, of beating us, it's going to be another safety. Guys like Kenny Galladay are dangerous, especially down the field. Jair, as good as he is and as fast as he is, he's a pretty small guy. If we've got a safety that can help over the top to kind of take away that deep threat, that, you know, Stafford likes to chuck it. The Lions like to throw it deep. Now, I don't know with Matt Patricia coming from New England if maybe they're trying to curtail that, get a little bit more short passing game going. I, I don't really know what the direction is, but I want to take that away from them. And with Amos and whoever up top, that really is going to take this this team to the next level. Obviously, we've got multiple picks. We can get a linebacker and a safety and whatever, but I'm just looking for that one piece, and that one piece is going to be a safety because, again, you take away the deep part of the field, you limit their abilities on the ground. It really limits what they're able to do. They're going to be taking little little chunk passes, little pieces here, five yards, six yards, eight yards, which is going to work to a point, but the idea behind that is the more opportunities that you take to get down the field, the more opportunities you're giving us to damage you, right? Whether it's an interception, a sack, or whatever. And it, it, that was part of the philosophy behind the bend, don't break. I would rather you be out there for 15 plays because eventually we're going to take advantage of you. We're going to get that ball away from you. We just want to limit chunk plays. As much as I generally don't like that, I like to be more aggressive and say, you know what, maybe you'll get lucky, but maybe we'll just take your head off in the process. We'll see who wins. I think in this case, I don't know if I want to play that game with Matt Stafford so much. And if we force them specifically, or you know, especially Matt Stafford, to change his philosophy and, and kind of turn it to dink and dunk, I kind of like our chances. Right, because the the teeth of the offense is going to be guys like Galladay just gashing you. If he's not doing that, and they're just going to dump the ball off to Johnson, as much as that can hurt you if you don't have an answer for it. I, you know, it, listen, listen. Bottom line: anytime you can just take away what it is that they want to do and force them to do something else, even if they're able to do it, I think you're winning that battle. So I, I really think a, a, a dominant safety is going to help us the most against the um, the Lions. I think as far as what the Lions might want to do to be able to attack the Packers. Offensive line would be pretty big. As far as that early pick, looking just at offense, it's kind of tough because there's no real offensive players there. I mean, I, I guess it would still be offensive linemen. Getting a guy like Jawan Taylor, even though, again, you don't really need, you know, 
Jonah Williams, it's a little bit early where they are, but that could be a trade back scenario. You get a guy like Jonah Williams, he slides in at right guard. He's a dominant right guard. He's one of the better run blocking guys uh, as far as the tackles go. He's going to be able to help block up some of these guys, get Johnson up to the next level. And again, he's probably going to be a better tackle than uh, Mr. Wagner is here. And, uh, you know, Wagner's been, I don't know what his contract situation is. I don't care to look it up, but he's been around long enough. Eventually, he could end up replacing somebody, not Taylor Decker, but maybe Wagner on the right side of the line. So I, I, I think more importantly, Detroit is going to be looking defense. And the oh no pick for me is going to be probably a pass rusher. Because again, they've got a, a solid guy on the end. They've got some good guys on the inside. And if they go out and get a guy specifically like I think Brian Burns, although I think he has a little bit more limitations as far as the run game, a guy that can fire off the Packers' right side, uh, the right tackle to try to get around him and, and manipulate while Trey Adams is holding down the other side, that could be a little bit scary. So anyways, at this particular point in time, and you know, call it bias if you want, I do think the Packers are still the better team. Lions have taken some pretty important steps. I think Trey Adams and a few of these guys, their slot corner and whatnot, are going to be good pieces. But um, I, I think the Packers still win this battle. But we'll have to see. I mean, the draft is going to be the most important thing. It's going to be really, really exciting to revisit some of this stuff after the fact to see what teams have, first of all, decided to do, but uh, also how that's going to impact things, not just this year, but in the future going forward. Because, you know, it's not just a 29th. This isn't like a redraft, like in uh, fantasy football. But anyways, I got to get going. NFC North, I, I, I stand by that. NFC North is going to be exciting. And we'll have to see which teams can rise to the occasion, which teams can't. But th- there's every reason to believe you got a four-way race for first place. If the Lions can get this their stuff together, they've got the weapons. They've got the running back, the quarterback, the wide receivers. They've got a good defensive front. They've got some potential at safety. They've got a they've got a number one corner. They've got all the cornerstones that you need. They got to round this thing out, and their coach, more importantly, has to be able to make this a cohesive unit. The Packers, we already know, have all the firepower that you could possibly need. They've got a ton of ammunition in the draft. They've got a very creative head coach. Um, they could easily be back on top. You look at the Bears and what they have in their defense. I think if their quarterback can take a step and stop being trash, no offense. I know Bears fans, you guys like them, but let's get serious. The guy is not good. That could be a formidable team. And the Vikings, you know, they, they might have the most, I, I don't know how to say, I mean, with those wide receivers, we've seen how lethal that team can be. I think that the 2017 version of the Vikings scares me about more than anything. Even though their defense technically, PFF-wise, wasn't as good as the Bears last year, it scared me a lot more because nobody could move on that defense, and that offense at times just couldn't be stopped. They just couldn't maintain that. So I'm excited. I wish we could just start the season so we could just see how this whole thing is unfolding, but that's something we really got to pay attention to. And again, for everybody similar to last year saying all the Bears are a joke, don't count them out. I'm telling you, maybe the Lions are going to be trash, but I'm certainly not going to count them out because they have all the pieces they need. They just need to put this thing together. But anyways, I'm out of here. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.